Oh, hello. Uh, following Lauren and Chris, uh, this is a tough task. Uh, so about seven years ago, my life was pretty frantic. I had this little company that made instrumentation and uh, material testing instrumentation. I was traveling a lot. So I'd sp spend a week and uh, a month in Germany, a week every five weeks in J Japan, and then some really uh, life-changing events happened to me. Uh, the first was I had a little girl, a, a daughter, and the second um, was that I was finishing my PhD, and the third was that I was diagnosed with uh, early stage esophageal cancer. And uh, I was going through chemotherapy, through treatment, so all of a sudden this life where I was traveling all the time uh, wasn't possible. So I really knew that I could focus on finishing my PhD and on my dissertation. Strangely, instead of looking out into the world, I started to really focus on this emerging, exciting field of nanotechnology, and at the time, how it related to material science. You'll see by what I'm going to talk about today that it kind of comes full circle, strangely, to the esophageal cancer as well. So I look at all of this stuff. It, you know, I was just at a conference on nanotechnology, and nanotechnology takes up every discipline in science. Biologists work in it and, and chemists. Well, I'm a physicist, so you know, I, I still find myself not being able to communicate with a lot of people in this community because it's not really a single community. Uh, so I'm now working on areas uh, of imaging. So I'm, I'm trying to see as small of things as I can possibly see with regular light mi microscopes but doing some interesting, sort of interesting things with those in order to be able to image them. So as far as from my standpoint, I think of it physically, whether I'm talking about looking at cells, whether I'm talking about looking at uh, semiconductors or about new materials. <coughs> but my background, what I really, what I teach at Columbia University and what I really have a, a passion for and a, a background with for polymers and, uh, and uh, liquid crystals and plasmas and these kind of things that are are a part of everybody's life now. Seven years ago, we're just starting to be. Uh, so th this is what I was interested in. And, but in order to be able to really look at new things, you could no longer just go into a lab and look with a standard microscope. So you're talking about looking at features that are in the nanometer range, so billionth of a meter. So things that I was interested in were about 100 nanometers in size. And so, you know, I had to figure out a, a, a way, and at the time, there wasn't a lot to figure out. We were stuck with sort of low megapixel cameras even seven years ago. We didn't have terabyte storage. There were a lot that we don't have. We didn't have good bit depth, so you couldn't take incredibly good digital images. So a lot of things that you can do now couldn't be done then. So I came up with sort of a mathematical way of using any type of device that has a sensor to see things that are smaller. And just to bring this a little bit first, so there's my, my little girl when she was only five. But the idea of what, we were try what, what I was trying to do, and th at this point, this is even, even up until three years ago, uh, this is all we could do, was theoretically de-blur an image, and then by, by moving at very small steps into something that we know what it looks like, be able to resolve that blurry image, into something that you would never be, wouldn't be able to see before. Uh, and so this obviously wasn't taken with a microscope, so it was a reverse process. Now, due to improvements in technology that I've been lucky enough to see, we're able to actually start with the, the blurred image and, and make it into something crisp. So uh, what we're gonna talk about today is the a certain type of, not so much nanotechnology, but the requirement of seeing in the nanoscale. So I say looking into the nano world. And we're gonna talk about this in terms of something called bioscaffolds. And not just regular bioscaffolds, if you have any idea what the, those are, but about actual regenerative medicine. So taking and growing organs from other materials and then having the, that organ that you've grown remain after you're finished. And so there are two different ways to do this. There's one which is called extracellular matrix, which we'll talk about, and the other is using silicone rubber. So silicone rubber to grow body parts. 
uh, a bit of a, a strange concept, but one that is actually picking up. If you look at this chart, you know, these are what well, I would say were futuristic ideas, even a few years ago. Well, laser surgery has been going on for a while. But if you look at this curve of regenerative medicine, it's really starting to take off. Now, take off doesn't mean that everybody here, cer certainly there's probably nobody here with a regenerative organ yet. But that, that won't be true um, in a matter of years. Um, we also have synthetic biology there as a rapidly growing field that didn't even exist when I was starting the work that I, I'm doing in nanotechnology. So if you were to look at a super resolution image of extracellular ma matrix, now what extracellular matrix is, in the case of synthetic, uh, in the case of regenerative medicine, it's usually a pig stomach that is taken and cleaned in a very rigorous process to get rid of all of the cells that were originally with the pig. And when you do that, you can use it to attach other cells to it in order to make new organs. Now, if you look at a uh, super resolution of this, you'll see that it looks like this felt-like structure. And that structure is necessary because that's where those are all going to be binding sites for the new cells, so stem cells that we're going to seed it with. And once you've done that, you do something, you put it in something called a bioreactor, which is just an environmental conditioning um, oven type machine, and you form it into a shape you want. And that shape that you'll see right there is an esophagus, uh, the, the one over to the left. So I told you a little bit about this, and I have to give credit because it's going to sound like I'm talking about something I had anything to do with. The only thing I'm doing is the imaging, which then hopefully helps create faster, better ways of doing this. But the real work on extracellular matrix is done at the McGowan Institute, which is associated with Pittsburgh uh, University Hospitals. And the, the, the part of the esophagus that we're concerned about is the epithelial layer, so this, this inner layer. And the way Dr. Turner at McGowan Institute says is they go in with an endoscope with kind of a hook on the end, and they pull it out, the epithelial layer, and it's like pulling a, a sock inside out. Uh, and I've seen videos of this, and it, it really is. And, that, and it's actually that quick and that simple, uh, that part of it. And so the cancer I had, for instance, was a type of cancer that had just penetrated the epithelial layer. So this is theoretically something that could have been done on me, but at the time didn't happen. But it has actually been done on five patients. So several animal models it's been done on, and it works very well. But this is pretty amazing stuff. So this, these were five patients at the University of Pittsburgh who had a condition called Barrett's esophagus. Barrett's esophagus is usually a precursor to, to or it can be a precursor to esophageal cancer. So they did this process of ripping it out and putting a new esophagus in place. So they're, what they're doing first is they put this scaffold, which is that scaffold that I showed before. And you'll see here what that was done with ECM. And the way that that worked was you, you put it in, you, you know, take out the original esophagus, put in the cleaned uh, new esophagus. And again, the, or we're here to do what I was doing at this point is just looking to see if there were any native cells left. Because if they're pig cells, it's a problem. You want to seed it with native cells from the human from, your, from your, your own cells, so that you're really creating esoph esophagus that's esophagus like you were just being born. So your esophagus, your epithelial layer of your esophagus is better than it ever was before. But I especially like uh, material science because it's repeatable, something we can do in the lab. A pig's stomach is not so repeatable. They do a wonderful job with it, but if this is going to be at 400 hospitals in a few years, which is what is being predicted, rather than at just a few, uh, just at one right now, then I want to create something synthetic that doesn't have any cells to wash away and that's completely reproducible. So what's being used in other types of regenerative medicine is a, a type of silicone rubber. And so what, what we're working on is taking polystyrene fibers, very tiny fibers, interweaving it to give it some type of structure and strength, and then controlling for porosity so that we can see if we can seed these. And then you would have an organ that could be easily grown. So that's what we'll, we'll focus on, is the silicone. 
So while, while I say that this is silly putty, I'm not just saying it's like silly putty, it actually is silly putty, which is a type of uh, rubber uh, elastomer called PDMS. And th that is what these organs are made of. Already, they're using this PDMS at, uh, at other places for growing bladders. Bladders are a bit simpler than esophagus for some reasons, but it's elastic, and so it, you, it's, it's elastic and it relaxes, and it's, it's good for binding. You don't have exactly the same challenges with a bladder as you do with an esophagus, however. But, you know, I, I took basically this challenge to my kitchen table with my seven-year-old now daughter, and we sort of played with Silly Putty for hours, saying, how can I take this Silly Putty and make it a felt-like structure, like the structure that we saw of the ECM? And that, that, and that really is the challenge that we're still faced with. So why do we choose this? Well, you know, these are some technical reasons, but the basic idea is that as you have forces, it gets more elastic. So if, it's, if you're swallowing something, it can react to it. But we also need to have, it can also be mapped. You know, everybody's taken Silly Putty and put it over a newspaper. I don't know if people even get Silly Putty anymore, but, but you know, it's great. You put it over a newspaper and you get the print of the newspaper. But we wanted to do that, we need to be able to do that with a vascular system. So we, 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 PDMS is a good way. Now this is, this is extremely difficult to, to make sense of by looking at. If you stared at it as long as I did, which I don't recommend um, if you're prone to headaches, but uh, we took this at, at, at high resolution. Um, it's 20x resolution, then we, we, we then looked at what we would think indicate porosity. So we need porosity like they needed felt-like structure in ECM, because it's those pores by which the cells are going to take, the proteins are going to take root in and create a new esophagus. So we looked at both the PDMS and at the ECM. So just looking here, I already noticed, without even looking at the, the quantitative data, we noticed that in the PDM, uh, uh, I'm sorry, on the ECM, we have sort of different size circles than we do. So what, what does that really mean? So the total area covered by porosity in the PDMS is 1865 square microns. But the total area covered by porosity is 1689 square microns, where in the PDMS, there are much larger pores. So and we notice that we have very small pores with the ECM, and they're not even really pores. They're like a, they're the, this fiber. So this required us to use this technique for seeing things smaller than we could before in order to then hopefully be able to create a structure that has receptors that are, that are similar to, to that of ECM. So the whole idea, reduce the porosity. So we can't do it just with sil silly putty on a table because we have to manufacture this at the nanoscale. So we work it at different things, but the first thing to understand is what actually needs to be accomplished. So if, if you look at this, uh, so per, 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 the, the reason why we care about porosity, I started to, to have to think about this. Why do we even care? So we understand that it provides for binding sites, but why do you care if it's a big hole or a small hole? Well, what happens is these cells get, while they're getting seated on the esophagus, they initially attach to the, through a protein called fibronectin, attach to the bioscaffold. So you're reliant on the scaffold to give it form, to give it shape. But then over time, they bind to each other in a much stronger way, and then it breaks apart the scaffold, and you digest the scaffold. So in order to write, have just the right elasticity, you need to have just the right pore size so that the fibronectin knows to bind to each other. And this is, this is a micrograph of that. And you, you see this, how, how all the different sites at which they need to come into contact. Um, and those will eventually combine to each other in these lines at which will then get rid of it. So, in order to really get this through, I always say we try to move from what is just in a laboratory, which is exciting new research, to be something that you can use on a mass scale. 
And in order to do that, we need to use super resolution. So this work that I was starting to work out theoretically seven years ago actually becomes really useful now that we're trying to look at something as small as, as proteins binding onto pores of a polymer. So that's the first thing we need. Then we need to be able to know exactly what size those pores are and be able to create a map of the system that we want to create. And so ultimately, while this seems not to be a very grand thing, this discovery we made was that small pores in PDMS allow for that expansion. And just by making that little discovery, we're taking this from the lab and we'll be going into surgery with it. And, that, and this is an ex exciting discovery. It starts with the esophagus and will eventually work for every organ so that my daughter will never have to worry about if she gets esoph esophagus cancer, not being able to travel around the world for a while. Thank you. <laughs>